Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. This is the word of God. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now they were, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were be bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God, and all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others mocking said, They are filled with new wine. This is the word of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. I was planning to teach you on the various gifts of the Holy Spirit, later part of this Holy Spirit series, including the speaking in tongues. But last Sunday, when we look into this passage to learn about the meaning and the significance of the Pentecost, uh, why Holy Spirit came, and why on the day of the Pentecost, what is that day, and on so. So, we looked into this and saw that he accompanied the speaking in tongues at the time. But I did not have the time to address this issue last Sunday, so I will do so today. Um, last Sunday, we looked into this, what Pentecost is, the meaning of it. Now we are asking, how and why the coming of the Holy Spirit accompanied this sign of speaking in tongues? Does it have a reason behind it? Does it have a meaningful message in it? Why the coming of the Holy Spirit accompanied this sign of speaking in tongues? Before we go there, why that happened, we will want to look into this first. I don't know how familiar you are with speaking in tongues, so what we're going to focus on first is what is it? What is it, speaking in tongues? Two, what is it for? The purpose, what is it for? Number three, is it for today? Is it for today? We will look into those three questions, right? And in doing so, we will see its significance with the Pentecost and what it is, why it happened, and so Good. Many things need to be addressed, and I can speak about tongue in many examples and many other ways, but I don't have time to do that, so let's go hurry up, okay? Stay with me. Number one, what is it? What is it? What is it speaking in tongue? Let's look into our text first. How the gift of tongue was first introduced to us. What kind of description he has right here? Look at verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, the word tongues here in original text, Greek, is glossa in plural. In the plural word is glossa. Now, the word glossa can be translated as tongues or as languages. Same. Glossa, either tongues or languages. Two things are clear in this text. One is that I cannot deny that the tongues in the Bible were real, genuine, intelligible human languages. Real, actual human languages. Two, speak in tongues was supernatural in its character. Let me say it again. Speaking tongue was supernatural in its character. Verse 4 says, they began to speak in other tongues or glossa languages as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. So these people were speaking in a language they did not know before, which they never learned before. 
Yes, supernaturally, because the Holy Spirit was giving them utterance, guiding their tongues. They were speaking in other languages. So, when you try to speak in second language or third language, I don't know, let's, let's say you try to speak in Spanish or in some Greek or some language, that you try to translate it in your mind. It's like, oh, how do I say I love you? I, I, okay. Those thought process of translation never took its place in their minds. Because Holy Spirit gave them utterance. Their tongues guided their mouth. This is why it was called tongues. So, the contents of what they were saying was not originated from their thought process. Oh, I'm going to talk about this. and No. So, the Holy Spirit gave them utterance and the contents came out. So this is clear in the Bible. Tongues were recognized by everyone as supernatural. If you have it, or if you have seen it, you will know that supernatural miracle is taking its place there. Undeniable. This is why it was a sign. Miracle. Wow. Supernatural. This is clear in this text of the book of Acts, and that is also clear in the first Corinthians, Paul's teaching on gifts of the Holy Spirit, including tongues there, both supernatural in its character. So, please follow me. Say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say hallelujah. Again. Faster, 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 more, faster. Okay, and in your mind as you are saying it, think, think, and ask God, God, give me the speaking of in tongues that give. I want tongues and say fast, fast. Keep saying it. Say it a thousand times that you will receive the gift of tongue. No. Far from it. And that is so wrong. Not by you practicing it. Not by you losing your tongue. <laughs> Not by just repeating the same word. Not by that. That's just meaningless gibberish. That kind of practice was actually done in pagan religions of that time. The sensual, aesthetic utterance. And they're just saying the names of their gods. Keep meaninglessly. And they thought... They're communicating with their gods spiritually. Really, that's the practice done in the pagan religions. If you have this, you will know that it is not you, but the Holy Spirit is giving you utterance, guiding your tongues, and speaking real, genuine, intelligible human language that you did not know before. Hold on. Isn't that what we see, at least here in this text? Verse 5 through 11. Now, it says, The Jews who came from diaspora, from all different regions and nations. I told you about diaspora. It's an immigrant community of Jewish people spread all over the places. right? And they were all coming to Jerusalem with proselytes. Proselytes means the Gentile converters. The Gentile now who follow and believe in Yahweh, God of Israel. Now, proselytes and the Jews who are living in all different regions and nations, they're all coming to Jerusalem to celebrate the day of Pentecost, or known as the Feast of Harvest, because that's the day all God worshippers, Yahweh worshippers, must present themselves in Jerusalem at the temple. So they're all coming. And... That they heard the disciples speaking in tongues. And look at verse 7. This is what they say. They were amazed and astonished and saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galilean? In other words, aren't these the people of Galilee? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native what? Language. So they heard what disciples were saying and speaking in tongues, and they literally understood what they were saying. Because it was spoken in their own back home languages. Now there is a huge gap that I see between the tongues in the Bible 
and tongues that many people claim to have in our modern days by the Pentecostal friends. Some of the early charismatic movement, remember I shared with you last Sunday, that actually the charismatic Pentecostal movement started in the early 20th century here in California. Some of them, their leaders in the group, they said the gift of the tongue has revived. We got it back again. It was lost throughout the church history. It was not practiced, but we are in the last state. Now we have it again, and we have the gift of tongues, and they send out missionaries. And they claimed that they do not need to study or learn the language of the native people of the mission field because they have the gift of tongues. They can simply evangelize to them through speaking in tongues. The result? They were all embarrassed, failed mission, and came back. Over several years, because this was a phenomenon that happened all over the world. People started to speak in tongues, and this penetrated into Christianity. So many studies have been conducted on the modern-day speaking in tongues, and all the linguistic experts concluded that the modern-day tongues have no real, intelligible, logical, human language patterns in them, but more close to the unintelligible gibberish, aesthetic utterance. So it is not like the one we see in the Bible. Now, many of our charismatic friends begin to explain that, well, there are two different types of tongues. Not only tongues of human languages, but tongues of angelic languages, tongues of angels. That's why you don't see the human language pattern. That's what we have, the tongues of angels. Now, we ask, do we have a biblical passage to support that claim that the angelic tongues were given to the church, such as that? Well, the passage they frequently turn to is the First Corinthians chapter thirteen. I hope you learn through today, church. Right, First Corinthians thirteen one. Paul says right there, "If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels." But have not love, I am noisy gong, and so on. And they say, see, you see right here, the tongues of men, and not only tongues of men, tongues of angels. So we have tongues of angels. We can speak the tongues of angels. That's what we have. But brothers and sisters, I cannot agree with that. I cannot go there because this is a hyperbolic statement. Not the angels have different languages as humans do. And we have a different language, but this is not there to say, you know what, angels have all different languages. Not that, nor that we have a tongue or language of the angels. This is a hyperbolic statement in order to stress the importance and the superiority of love. If you read the context in the chapter 12, Paul speaks about various gifts of the Holy Spirit, but they are all for building up. But superior one is this, more than anything, love. And the chapter 13, the famous passage of love, love. Even if you have it, even if you have not just tongues of men, but tongues of angels. If you have no love, you're nothing. How do I know that? In the next statement, verse 2, right after that, he says, even if I know all mysteries and all knowledges. Now, the Paul is not saying there, you see right here that we can be omniscient. I can have all knowledges, all mysteries. He's not saying the man can be omniscient. He's not saying men can have all knowledges. This is a hyperbolic statement. When I say, if I am big as a mountain, I am so, like, if I say that, I am not saying I'm big as a mountain. It is to stress, emphasize the point. There is no biblical passage, at least, from what we can see is that supports the angelic tongues were given to the church. Others say 
You know what? Tongues in book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, what we read, and tongues in the Corinthian church are two different types or two kinds of ch- tongues. Yes, tongues in book of Acts is a language, human language, but the Corinthian church is different, not human language, something else. This is why Paul said it is not understandable, so you got to have, you got to ask for the gift of the interpretations. Well, no. It was not understandable, not because it was angelly tongues, but because nobody spoke their language in that church of city of Corinth. It was languages that they did not know. Furthermore, the church in Corinth suffered many problems, serious problems, including counterfeit tongues. You read the letter of Corinth. Aesthetic gibberishes were everywhere so that they can boost their ego, so that they can show that I am somehow the superior Christian than other people. I speak this, and this to aesthetic earnest. And this is why Paul says, not only prophecy, the tongue, you got to wait it. In other words, test it if it is really right. This is why Paul says you got to have the gift of the interpretations. You must test it, and the interpretation must accompany it. So many counterfeit fakes were going on. Now, number two, we ask, what is it for? What is it for? Keep that in mind, church. The main purpose of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, various gifts of the Holy Spirit, is not, are you with me? Hello? It's not Personal, individual experience. Oh, I feel it. I, not. They are. Not for ego, self-ego boosting. All the gifts of the Holy Spirit are for, this is what it is for, mutual edification. Building up the church. Edifying one another. Encouraging comfort, consolation of the church. It is for the community. Holy Spirit gives each person different gifts for the mutual growth and building up. You have that, you have this, you have that, and help grow. That's clear if you read chapter 12, 13, 14 of 1 Corinthians for the community of believers. Gifts are to serve one another. Well, I will speak more on this later part of this series. So I don't know when, the Lord willing, when I speak about various gifts of the Holy Spirit, how Holy Spirit empowered the church. Well, being said that, it is so with the gift of the tongues as well. That's what it is for at one level. Let me show you. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 6. Now, therefore, if I come to you speaking in tongues... How will I benefit you unless I bring some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? What is Paul's concern right there? How can I benefit you? How can I benefit you? His concern is benefiting other people, believers. Verse 10, there are doubtless many different languages in the world and none, of, none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language... I will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker will be a foreigner to me. So, with yourself, since you are eager for manifestation of the Spirit, what do you need to do? Strive to excel in building up the church. Pursue. Do your best. For what? Whatever you do, to build up the church. Therefore, now this conclusion, he goes, one who speaks in tongue should pray that he may Interpret. You have gift of tongue? You ask that you may also have the gift of interpretation. Now let me jump to verse 28. There he says, What then, brothers? When you come together, each one has, now he has him, his lesson, revelation, and what? A tongue and or interpretation. Each person. Let all things be done for what? Building up. All the gifts were for what? Building up. If any speaking in a tongue, let there be only two or at most, at 
animals, three, and each in turn, taking turn. And let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in the church and speak to himself and to God. Is speaking in tongues meant to be normal, normative part of our worship service? We all speak in tongues when we come together? No. No interpretation, then silent in the church. Why? Tongue with interpretation has revelatory function. In other words, like a revelation, almost like a prophecy. Sometimes new message uttered by the Holy Spirit or reiterate the message already given to us. And Holy Spirit, oh, interpretation, we all learning. And somebody speaking in tongue and interpretation comes. This is what the Lord says that we all learn and edify it. Building up, building up. Ah, that's right. That's what our church was lacking. We were lacking in love. We were lacking in evangelism. Oh, that's what the Lord will do for us. Oh, mutual edification with the interpretation. Great benefit in the community of faith. But without interpretation, Paul says, no one can understand. Therefore, Tongue has no benefit. Did you hear me what I just said? Without interpretation, Paul says, no benefits. Don't do it. Wait. Did you just notice how important it is to engage with your mind? Understanding? This generation of Christianity are moving away from mind and thinking. They're all about emotions, sensuality, experience, not mind. To the point, Paul says, don't do it at all in a church without interpretation because there's no mind engaging God's truth. No need to. To Paul and also to our Lord Jesus, our minds matter. Do you remember what Jesus says? What is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord with your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. What did Paul say in Romans 12? Be transformed by how? Renewal of your mind according to his truth. Rethink, renew your mind. Renew your mind to obey God. Jesus taught us how to pray. And look at all the examples of Jesus' prayer. John 17, the whole chapter of Jesus' prayer. Or see the Jesus' prayer in John when he raised the Lazarus, the dead one. And he prayed in front of the people. He did not pray in some angelic language. He did not pray some aesthetic utterance. He prayed logical human language, logically mind, prayed, and they understood. Disciple understood, they wrote it down. He always prayed at the, before the crucifixion in Gethsemane. In the groaning and suffering and pain and sorrow, Jesus did not pray in some sort of tongues of angelic language. No, he prayed. If anybody knows the angelic language, wouldn't it be Jesus? But he prayed the human languages with, their, with his intellect and mind. And isn't Jesus the example that we Christians should follow? He always did. Actually, Jesus in Matthew 6, 7 warned us not to pray like this. Not to pray like this. He says, when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as Gentiles do. Empty phrase. Don't say just empty, a lot of empty phrases. Building up empty phrases. That empty phrase is bata logesete in Greek. You know what that means? Aesthetic utterance. Meaningless utterance. And that's what Gentiles do. Literally at this time, pagan in their pagan religions, they would say, for example, first, oh, Jesus, 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 God, 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 Jesus, keep saying that. Don't do that. 
Don't try to think that because you just have to say a lot of those words and spend four hours, then your God may hear you. No, your God, you say it. You don't earn the answers of, from God by saying a lot of words, by putting effort in it. You logically, intelligently, with your mind, ask, and your Father knows what you need and hear. You don't have to really repeat, God, you know, God, you know, God, you know. No, he already know. You are trying to earn his answer by putting some human religious effort. So, those kind of pagan practice sadly penetrated into Christianity. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 14, church, do you see what I see? He says, for if, if I pray in tongues, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. Paul, why would you care about your mind being unfruitful? Don't you see repeatedly again and again, Paul's concern, main focus, his chief concern is my mind. And my spirit can be benefited, but my mind is unfruitful. Verse 19, nevertheless, in a church, I'd rather speak five words with my what? Mind, in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a town. And you will see what is being weighted here. Mind. Coming to God. This is why Paul said repeatedly, if you have gift of tongues, ask for the gift of interpretation. Tongue got to be accompanied with interpretation. What is interpretation? It's supernaturally, by the Holy Spirit's empowerment, you understand what's being said even if you don't speak the language. Oh, I don't understand what is being said here. So that it may be fruitful to your mind and to the mind of the church people. If there is no benefit, now, are you with me, church? Now, the speaking in tongue, if it has no benefit apart from the interpretation by itself, that's what Paul says. Apart from interpretation, it has no benefit to the mind. Then what is this really for? What is this really for? Now, let me tell you the chief meaning and purpose of tongue. The chief purpose of speaking in tongue is for witnessing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Witnessing the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is why Paul says, 1 Corinthians 14, 22. Thus, see this. Thus, tongues are a sign, not for believers. You see that? But for who? For unbelievers. While the prophecy is a sign, not for unbelievers, but for believers. Now, I will come to prophecy when we come to the gift of the Holy Spirit later. But tongues for Unbelievers. Now let's come back to our Acts text. Book of Acts chapter 2 text. Would you? Look at verse 11. Look at verse 11. These people were saying, those Jews and proselytes, say that what? We hear them telling in our tongues. What do they hear? What is the message? The mighty works of God. That's what they heard in their languages. What God has done through the person of Jesus Christ. The mighty works of salvation. We hear them. Each of us. In our language, what God has done, the gospel. Hmm. Now, the implication of this is very significant. Now, we ask, why the coming of the Holy Spirit accompanied, especially this sign, this miracle, speaking in other languages and communicating the gospel in other languages? Let me take you back to the beginning of the book of Acts. Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit comes, you will receive what? Power. Power to do what? To be my witness. Remember that? Now, confusing of the languages, human language was originated from what? If you've been in Sunday school before, you probably know this. According to the Bible, where all different languages came from, it came from the Tower of Babel story in Genesis 11. Now, humanity after Noah, 
they try to build a tower so high they can reach to the heaven. And this is what they say in Genesis 11 verse 4. Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a what? Name for ourselves lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. They said, let's build a tower and making our name known. In other words, what they were saying, let's build a tower so we can proclaim our mighty work, how great we are, our power. Amen. And they really believed. They wanted to be like God. They believed if we can build a tower. We can go to heaven. We don't need God's help. We can go to heaven by ourselves. And in doing so, they directly rebelled God's command. What did God say? God said, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Spread and fill the earth. And they say, let's not. Let's not disperse. Let's just stay together. So you read this story. Now this, speaking language, speaking in tongues, take us back to that. And you read that story. Confusing their languages so they cannot communicate with each other. Was God, that was God's judgment on their rebellion and sin. Let me put it this way. The language differences we have was God's punishment on us. Language differences was God's punishment. Are you with me so far? So, in Genesis 10, you see the list of the people, group, and clans, and nation of that known world. In our text, I want, I want you to see how this is parallel. In our text, we see the list of the people, group, and nations of that time known world. And Genesis 11 is about proclaiming the great works of man. Here, through the language, proclaiming the great works of God. And confusing of the language was God's punishment. Then, what does it mean that good news of Jesus being communicated despite of the language difference, beyond and over the language difference to all people? This means reversal of the curse. This means the time of salvation, time of the restoration has come because of Jesus Christ. Now, a new covenant. Remember, last Sunday we talked about what is the meaning of the Pentecost. It's about God making a new covenant with His people. Now, the salvation is being offered not only to Israelites. Now, salvation is now being offered to all people, Gentile. And that is why this sign was accompanied with the coming of the Holy Spirit. Gospel being proclaimed in all different languages. New age, new era, new covenant in Jesus Christ has arrived. This is the reason why the speaking in town happened with the coming of the Holy Spirit. You see? If you wonder why so many miracles such as speaking in town took its place in the early church time, and not so much right now. Why come church is not so much miracles? Because the miracle, if you read the Bible, whenever the new things are happening, the new prophetic ministry, Elijah and Elisha, or a new beginning, Moses and Exodus, when the laying the foundation of something happens, it can accompany many miracles, and many miracles were given from God in order to authenticate, credit, authorize the message that they carry. Prophets give miracle, so God making sure, oh, you listen to the prophet. Remember what Nicodemus said in John chapter 3 in the conversation of Jesus? This is what Nicodemus says to Jesus. Jesus, I know that you are from God because otherwise no one can do these kind of miracles as you do. Miracles were given so that they may listen to the message. So that they may know this person that was actually sent from God. This was to serve for that function. You got to listen to these people. Number three. Is it for today? Is it for the today? Some of my dear charismatic friends in the reform circle 
I'm a reform circle within our reform circle and my I I love them. I respect them. I respect my some of those pastors and theologians and they believe these supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit continues today until this day and will and others believe and it has ceased. And we no longer have it. It was only for the apostolic time. It was only for the early church period. As some people, within, even, within our, even within our reforms, some people, it continues. Some people believe, no, it has ceased. I know. This is not an easy thing to settle down. Because, let me tell you why. No place in the Bible explicitly say to us that it will continue throughout the church period till the end. And no place in the Bible explicitly tells us that it will cease after the early church period. So we are all seeing. But one place I can turn to is this. Would you pay attention to this with me? 1 Corinthians 13 verse 8. Paul says, love, as for love, love never ends. But as for the prophecies, they will pass away. And as for pay attention, as for tongue, they will what? Cease. The grace come to an end. As for knowledge, it will pass away. Because for we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial, all these things are partial. All these things partial will pass away. Now, so it has or it will cease one day. When? When? The question is, at what point? When? It says, when the perfect comes. What does it mean when the perfect comes? I think that means or refers to the return of Jesus Christ on the last day that the perfect comes. But I also think the finished canonization of the Bible is a part of the perfect breaking into our time because we know that God's word is eternal. Jesus says, heaven and earth will fade away, but not even an iota, not even a dot from this will fail. Something eternal we have here. This is sufficient, without error. Therefore, there's no new revelation given to us that we need to attach to the end of the Bible. We got to keep adding more books, more books, more pages, more chapters here. No, because the revelation has ended. This is complete and perfect for its purpose, for our faith, what we need to believe, what we need to do, all written here. Everything that God wants you to know, believe, and do, all here. On that note, all Christians, all right Christians will agree. This is done. Perfect. Now I said, along with prophecies, tongues with interpretation has revelatory function, like a revelation giving messages. And I think that is partial. So when the complete New Testament, at this time in the early church, they did not have it. Complete New Testament. Complete New Testament was written. They were all put together along with the Old Testament forming the complete version of the Bible given to the church. Then I I think, that's my opinion, I think that from there we see those temporal revelatory gifts start to cease significantly. We have it now. What we need to know and believe. Without this New Testament, think about we are church without the New Testament. Prophecy and tongues, they were precious. What does God say on this, on that? I know the missionaries in the places where the gospel is still so foreign to those people, where the Bible in their language is very rare or not available, or the strong church is not organized, or persecution still happens. I know that they will testify to you and me. I heard a lot of stories. Many miracles happened there, and I can see that. But in my good Honestly, church, honestly, in my honest conscience, 
I cannot deny that I see a huge discrepancy between the tongues in the Bible and tongues practiced in our modern days. At least that I cannot deny. When I was young, I was very familiar with charismatic movement. I was part of it too. Since I was little, I'm talking about little. And in my early youth, I practiced and I asked God for the gift of the tongues. I want it. I want it. And they have it. He has it. She has it. I want it. I practiced. I practiced it. And at the time, sometimes I thought I had it. And I was saying all that. But to be honest with you, many times during the time, I also doubted. Is this really the speaking in tongues? Or am I just saying anything and get all emotional? Is this the Holy Spirit really uttering, guiding my tongues? And I always wondered, church, how come I see so many people speaking in tongues, but so little, to be honest, zero person has a gift of interpretation in our days. I just see so many people. Okay, let's just say we have the gift of tongues of the angels. And many people claim to have it and practice it. But as numerous as they are, how come if God has given us that, and the Bible tells us, seek for the gift of the interpretation, may the tongue always be accompanied with interpretation in the church. How come we have so little, almost zero, gift of interpretation in the church? I've never seen anybody truly have a gift of interpretation. I met once a lady who said she has a gift of interpretation. When I was young, back in Korea, when I went to the mountain, prayer mountain, I met a lady who said, oh, you're speaking in tongues. I know I have a gift of interpretation. I was so excited and praying, and she was saying, but I knew when she said it was superficial, I know she did not have it. She was basically saying the same thing, repeating again and again. Oh, you're saying you love God. She said, oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. One person told him, said a story that he went to a church, and the person says, I have a gift of tongue, and then speaking in tongues. And the other person says, I have a gift of interpretations. What is, what's being said right here? Oh, God is saying to give, us, give each other big hug. Really? That's the revelation from above, God. Give each other big hug. Anybody can say that. Who would know that is right or wrong? Let me end with this. I'm done. As for you, my beloved, focus on knowing God, loving God, learning His truth, and praying to God with your mind. Because he made it known to you in human language. God who does not speak one human language. In our human language, God revealed himself and gave his word. And made himself known to you that you can think, understand, believe with your mind. That's a God-given mind. His gift. Learn, know, think, pray with mind according to his truth and focus on edification of each other serving one another with whatever God has given to you it is for to build each other up it's for build each other up focus on that if you ever feel inadequate in your prayer I don't know what to say my heart is troubled I don't know what to say don't worry the Holy Spirit is interceding for us with groaning too deep for words. You say what you can say. He searches and He knows your heart. He knows what you need. When you feel inadequate to serve and help other people or church, build each other or comfort, seek the Holy Spirit. Your Lord, Savior Jesus, has given Him to you to be your helper. I cannot pray. Has ask Holy, Holy Spirit, help me to pray. Help me to pray. Help me to love. Help me to serve. Help me to comfort. 
He's your helper. Let's pray.